So now we shall be discussing about breast cancer. We have divided the breast cancer into various subtopics as it is a very important core topic for your exam. So first subtopic that we shall discuss for breast cancer would be the risk factors. The risk factors for breast cancer can be classified into three broad groups which are your modifiable risk factors, non-modifiable risk factors and histological risk factors. So I have taken three tables, modifiable risk factors, non-modifiable risk factors and the histological factors from your standard test book of Bailey and Love and Sabiston. So let's take a look at the various risk factors. So the first that we have is a modifiable risk factor. Obesity. So obesity has an increased risk in postmenopausal women. Then we have parity. So there is an increased risk in nulliparous women or the first pregnancy after 35 years of age. Then breastfeeding. It is protective for breast cancer and more than 12 months of breastfeeding by women has a greater protective effect than shorter duration. So it is more than 12 duration or uh, 12 months of breastfeeding which has a greater effect. Now age at first childbirth. Early childbirth has a less risk compared to the late childbirth which has a high risk. Then we have use of hormone replacement therapy that use uh, for more than 10 years is associated with an increased risk. Tobacco use has been associated with an increased risk for breast cancer. Then for the alcohol consumption and the radiation exposure are also associated with increased risk of breast cancer. Then we move down to the non-modifiable risk factor. So the age is a non-modifiable age risk factor and increasing age is a risk factor. The median age of presentation is around 60 in the West whereas in India it is around 48. So there is a gross difference of the median age of presentation in the Western countries compared to India. Then female sex is a risk factor for breast cancer. Then ethnicity, American, white, African, Jew, Parsi have also been associated to have a higher risk of breast factor. And then the family history of breast cancer. One first degree relative with breast cancer has a relative risk of two, whereas two first degree relatives associated with breast cancer have a relative risk of three of having a breast cancer. Then the genetic predisposition, around 5 to 10 percent of all the breast cancers are hereditary, BRCA1 and BRCA2 are the mutations right, which account for 70 percent of the hereditary breast cancer. Then early menarche, breast cancer risk increases by around 5 percent for each year earlier menstruation begins. Then your late menopause, breast cancer increases your risk by about 3 percent for each year late menopause begins. So it is 3 year, 3 percent for late menopause and 5 percent for earlier menopause. Then we have high risk breast lesion which include your proliferative conditions without atypia having a relative risk of 1.8 to 2. Then we have complex fibroadenoma which has a relative risk of 3. Then we have papillomatosis which has a relative risk of 3. Then we have proliferative diseases with atypia and atypical ductal lobular hyperplasia which has a relative risk of 4. And this is a very important point over here, the lobular carcinoma in C2 which has a relative risk of 8 to 10. Please remember that as per the new staging, LCIS is now considered as a risk factor and no more as a carcinoma. Right. So this are your non-modifiable risk factors. Now the histological risk factors include your, which we have already included uh, in your non-modifiable risk factors, non-proliferative disease, proliferative disease without a tepia, proliferative disease with a tepia and strong family history and lobular carcinoma in C2. So these are your risk factors for breast cancer. So please do read them as it is a potential uh, MCQ point in your exams. Now the next topic that we have in breast cancer is with respect to your pathology. So the 90% of our, uh, breast cancer arises from your milk ducts, right? 
so they are around 90 percent are your ductular carcinoma only 10 percent arise from your lobules which is your lobular carcinoma now there is a tumor grading which is your bloom richardson Now, this score includes some of three variables. So, what are those three variables? Percentage tumor cells with tubule formation, then we have nuclear pleomorphism, and we have size and number of mitosis per 10 hyper field right so bloom richardson score is including the sum of three variables a minimum score of each category is your one and a maximum score of three so on the basis of this a grade one grade two and grade three is given so a score from three to five is your grade one 6 to 7 is grade 2 and 8 to 9 is your grade 3 right now regarding the most common variety of breast cancer is your invasive breast cancer which is non-specified type then regarding your colloid and mucinous carcinoma they have your abundant of mucine then in case of medullary carcinoma they have your marked lymphocytic reaction and regarding your papillary carcinoma they have a better prognosis right and lymph node or blood mets are rare. So, these are your few important one liner questions that are asked from the pathological part of your breast cancer. Now, let us take a look at a uh, few of the images of the uh, pathology of the breast cancer which has been taken from these textbook of Sabiston. So, we have this first image over here which is your lobular carcinoma in situ. So, just a minute, oh yeah. So, we have your lobular carcinoma in situ over here. So, if you see over here, the neoplastic cells are small, right, with compact band nuclei and are distending the asini but they are preserving the cross-sectional architecture of the lobular unit, right. So, this is your lobular carcinoma in situ. Then, the second image that we have is of your DCIS solid type. So, if we look at the image over here, over here the cells are larger compared to the cells in the LCIS, right and the cells are contained within the basement membrane of the duct and do not invade the stroma. So, the cells in DCIS do not invade the stroma and they are contained within the basement membrane and are larger compared to your lobular carcinoma in situ. Then we have your third variety which is your DCS, DCIS crib reform type. So, what do we see in your uh, crib reform type? Sorry, this is not the crib reform, this is your com uh, comedo type. Okay. So, what we see in your comedo type that at the center there is an area of necrosis, right. So, in DCI's comedo type, there is an area of uh, necrosis in the center, right. So, this is an area of necrosis in the center. And last we have your DCIS which is your cribriform type 
right so what happens over here is that the bridge of the tumor cells span the ductal space and leave round punched out hole spaces right so if you see over here the bridge of tumor uh, cells span the ductal space and leave round and punched out spaces so these are your example uh, histological images of your non invasive breast carcinoma right and then looking at the images of your invasive breast cancer right so the first one that we have is your lobular car invasive ductal carcinoma which is not otherwise specified so if you see that over here the malignant cells invade haphazardly right so there is no specific patterns but the uh, malignant cells invade haphazardly over here so this is your invasive ductal carcinoma now if you look at the second image over here you will see that the malignant cells invade in a characteristic file pattern right in a characteristic file pattern so this is a case of your invasive lobular carcinoma right so we hear the malignant cells are invading in a characteristic file like pattern now if you look at the third image what you see over here is that the cancer cell invades in small tubules which are lined by a layer of well defined epithelium cells right so this is an example of invasive tubular carcinoma over here the cancer cells are invading right if you see a small tubules right cancer cells are invading a small tubules which are lined by a single layer of well differentiated epithelium now moving down to the next pathological image if we see over here this is an example of mucinous or colloid carcinoma now why do we see this over here because if you look at the image the bland tumor cells float in the lakes of mucin so this is your lake of mucin right where your bland tumor cells float and then the last image that we have is of your medullary carcinoma now why do we call it a medullary carcinoma the distinctive feature over here is your infiltrate of the lymphocytes and the syncytium appearing sheet of tumor cell so if you see over here there is a cross inflammation of the lymphocyte and the syncytium sheet of the tumor cells are present right so this is an example of your medullary carcinoma so this is what we had to discuss in your pathology of breast cancer now moving down to the next topic which is your spread so the spread in breast cancer could be of three types it could be either a local spread or a hematogenous spread or a lymphatic spread now in your local spread it could be a spread to the skin satellite nodules pectoralis major or the serratus anterior now this tumor cell secrete a number of growth factors which include your fibroblast growth factor right fibroblast growth factor then it includes your vasoendothelium growth factors and tumor growth factor a and transforming growth factor b so the growth factors secreted by tumor cells include your fibroblast growth factor vasoendothelial growth factor or transforming growth factor alpha and transforming growth factor beta so this fibroblast growth factor causes the mitosis of the adjacent fibrocyte which convert into the fibroblast and lay down the collagen now this con now this particular part is called your desmoplastic reaction so the contraction of the collagen causes the shortening of cooper ligament which leads to 
डिम्पलिंग दैट इज योर शॉर्ट एंड सिंगल कूपर लिगामिन और इट मे लीड टू योर दीदरिंग विच दीथरिंग विच इज योर मैनी कूपर लिगामिन आर श्रंक राइट देन द लिम्फैटिक मेटास्टिस द लिम्फैटिक मेटास्टिस मेनली ऑकर टू योर एग्जरेरी लिम्फ नोट नाउ इफ देर इज एन इन्वॉल्वमेंट ऑफ योर कॉन्ट्राक्टल लिम्फ नोट इन एबसेंस ऑफ कॉन्ट्रालैक्टल प्राइमरी देन this is suggestive of metastasis right now what causes this uh, contralateral lymph node axillary meds so it could be because of hematogenous spread or via the subdermal lymphatics or via the ipsilateral internal mammary nodes or it could be also because of your tumor developing in the epithelial embryonic cell rest trapped in lymph node during embryonic development then the hematogenous spread now at a tumor size of 1 to 2 mm which is around 10 to the power 5 cells new angiogenesis occur which causes your rapid growth invasion and metastatic potential now the skeletal system is involved where most commonly involved is the lumbar vertebrae followed by neck of femur and thoracic vertebrae now this bony metastases are usually found to be osteolytic however they can be osteosclerotic as well well so like mainly it is your osteolytic then the hematogenous meds may also occur to your liver lung brain and rarely to your adrenal gland and ovaries then the tumor cells in weight and replace the bone marrow so what happens over here is that there is immature blast cells in your peripheral smear right which leads to the picture of leukoerythroblastic anemia right and the clinical presentation now moving down to the clinical presentation the most common presentation is a discrete lump the most common tumor site is your upper outer quadrant upper outer quadrant now the image shown over here is a classical uh, appearance like an orange peel which is known as per the orange now this is due to the involvement of your subdermal lymphatics right next another uh, classical picture that is of sometimes seen is of your cancer and cuirassae i see so what happens over here is that there is an extensive tumor infiltration so an extensive tumor infiltration of skin of the breast skin of breast upper limb and abdomen right and some other clinical presentations with which the patient might present to you include your nipple discharge skin ulceration swelling in neck and armpit and the distant metastasis feature would include your bone pain cough breathlessness hemoptysis headache visual disturbances neurological deficits epileptic fits anorexia weakness weight loss and features of hypercalcemia so this was the part 1 of discussion of breast cancer in your next part we shall be discuss discussing further on the treatment and staging thank you in this video now we shall continue our discussion on breast cancer so moving on to the next topic of breast cancer which is your staging so tis this is carcinoma in situ 
Now an important point to be noted over here is that it is DCIS. LCIS is no longer considered a carcinoma in C2. So please remember that LCIS is no longer an entity of carcinoma in C2. Then we have T1. So T1 is tumor less than 2 cm in size. Now we have T1 MI. So what is this T1 MI? This is tumor less than 1 mm in greatest dimension. So 1 mm in greatest dimension right so for ease we can also remember 2 centimeter is equal to 20 mm now 1a is tumor of size between 1 mm to 5 mm 1b is between 5 mm to 10 mm and 1c is 10 mm to 20 mm and then moving down to t2 this is 2 cm to 5 cm size tumor and then T3 is more than 5 cm size of tumor. Then T4A is involvement of chest wall structure and important point to be remembered over here is that involvement of pectoralis major does not qualify for T4A. Right. So, involvement of pectoralis major does not qualify for T4A. Then T4B includes your skin ulceration. Then they have your satellite nodules. Then they also include your per D orange. Then T4C are your T4A plus B then we have T4D. So, T4D is your inflammatory breast carcinoma. So, what is this inflammatory breast carcinoma? Now, they include your per the orange and redness which is involving more than one third of the breast which may be with or without lung associated with or without lung. So this is your T staging of your breast cancer. Now moving down to the clinical nodal staging of your breast cancer. So we have CN1 which is your metastasis to movable epsilateral level 1 and 2 axillary lymph node. So, this is your metastasis to epsilateral movable uh, metastasis to epsilateral movable level 1 and 2 axillary lymph node. Then we have CNMI which is your micro metastasis right. Then we have CN2A. So, this is to metastasis to epsilateral fixed or matted lymph nodes. Then N2B is metastasis to epsilateral internal mammary lymph nodes. Now an important point to be remembered over here is that it is in absence of axillary lymph node. Right. Then we have CN3A. So, this is your metastasis to infraclavicular lymph node. Then N3B is metastasis to ipsilateral internal mammary 
lymph node plus epsilateral axillary lymph node then we have N3C which is your metastasis to your supra clavicular lymph node right and M0 is absence of distant metastasis and M1 is presence of distant metastasis and metastasis to the contralateral axillary lymph node in absence of the contralateral breast tumor is also a metastasis right so this is about your staging of breast cancer and uh, to end the staging of breast cancer we have one table which we have taken from the textbook Bailey and Love. So this basically summarizes your key changes that have been made in your 8th edition. So let's take a look at it. Lobular carcinoma in situ is a high risk benign lesion not a cancer as we discussed just a while ago while discussing the TIS in your T staging then the T categorization of the multiple synchronous tumor is documented using the M modifier. The prefix Y is used to denote the post neoadjuvant therapy. Then we have satelloid nodules in the skin must be separate from the primary tumor for it to be categorized as T4B. So please remember that the satellite nodule should not be present with the tumor. It should must be a separate entity from the primary tumor to be categorized as 4TB. The pathological complete response denotes the absence of tumor cells in the breast and axillary rows in surgical specimens. Then we have inflammatory carcinoma remains in, uh, classified as inflammatory carcinoma after NACT even after complete remission. So this is again an important MCP, MCQ point that you need to remember that in spite of the neoadjuvant chemotherapy the inflammatory breast carcinoma remains as inflammatory breast carcinoma. Then we have microinvasive carcinomas that are defined as invasive tumor foci of less than 1 mm. Then tumors of more than 1 mm and less than 2 mm should be reported as rounded to 2 mm and the tumor should be measured to the nearest millimeters. Right. So this is all about your staging of breast cancer. Now moving down to the next topic which is your metastatic workup. So this metastatic workup can be classified for the early breast cancer and for the locally advanced breast cancer. So what is your locally advanced breast cancer? So T3, T4 and N2, N3 are classified as a locally advanced breast cancer and the metastatic workup is done with a CECT scan of your abdomen pelvis, chest and a bone scan. So this is required for a metastatic workup of your locally advanced breast cancer whereas in case of early breast cancer which is T1, T2, N0 or N1 they do not require any metastatic workup it is required done only if there are symptoms of metastasis present right so this is about your metastatic workup in case of a locally advanced breast cancer and an early breast cancer now moving down to the next topic which is your neoadjuvant systemic therapy. So this neoadjuvant systemic therapy consists of neoadjuvant chemotherapy then they have your targeted therapy and your hormonal therapy. So what is the basic aim to of the neoadjuvant systemic therapy? It is to downsize the tumor and to know the in vivo response 
of the tumor. So what would be the indications of your neoadjuvant systemic therapy? It would be your locally advanced breast cancer and some select cases of your early breast cancer. So what are this early, the selected cases of early breast cancer that qualify to undergo your neoadjuvant chemotherapy? Right. So it is to downsize breast tumors to facilitate your breast conservation surgery. Then in cases of triple negative breast cancer, then we have in cases of HER2 positive breast cancer, then in cases of premenopausal women who are aged less than 50 years, premenopausal women age less than 50 years and the last uh, criteria in cases of early breast cancer is patients with axillary lymph node metastasis. So, these are some of the select cases of early breast cancer which qualifies for neoadjuvant chemotherapy. Now, how is the response assessment done and when is it done? It is usually done three after three weeks after administration of your second chemotherapy. Then how is it done? It is done with the help of a criteria which is known as your resist criteria. So what is your resist criteria? It is response evaluation criteria in solid tumors. Right. So we have this four response which are CR, PR, SD, PD. So CR is your complete response. PR is your partial response. Then SD is your stable disease and PD is your progressive disease. So what do you mean by complete response? So in complete response, lesion is not detectable either clinically or on imaging, either clinically or on imaging. Then what is your partial response? In partial response, there is more than 30% reduction in the maximal diameter. So more than 30% reduction in the maximal diameter. And then what is your stable disease? Stable disease is your less than 30% reduction in maximal diameter and we have a progressive disease which is more than or equals to 20% increase in your maximal diameter. So now this brings us to the next part of this that is the management after your neoadjuvant chemotherapy response. So if the cases have your complete response or the pathological response, then your entire chemotherapy, therapeutic drug regimen can be given prior to the surgery, right. 
now whereas in the patient showing a stable disease or a progressive degree should undergo surgery after initial two cycles of chemotherapy now in case of this complete response and pathological response if the patient is being planned for a bcs then what we can do is a radio opaque clip or a magnetic seed a magnetic clip like a max seed it can be placed in the epicenter of tumor why to identify at the time of surgery right uh, now the recent Bailey uh, also mentions that if your radio opaque clips or your magnetic seeds are not available then in that scenario a 0.5 centimeter silicon catheter tip may also be used right so this is all about your neoadjuvant systemic therapy now moving down to the next part is your surgery so what are your margins involved in your dcis your margin involved is 2 mm whereas in invasive carcinoma it is no ink margin right so this are your current standards there is no confusion regarding this it's even mentioned in your recent edition of bailey and love so the margin for dcis would be 2 mm whereas the margin for the invasive breast cancer would be a no ink margin so the first surgery that we discuss is the modified radical mastectomy which involves which includes your axillary dissection so what are the conditions that in which you are going to do mrm the various uh, indications are your large tumors this is in con uh, this is in relation to the size of the breast right in relation to size of the breast then in cases of multi centricity right then if there is diffuse micro calcification then your other conditions are BRCA positive cancer and obviously the patient preference so this are your indications where you would be doing a MRM now the skin and nipple sparing mastectomy so what are the conditions when you can do a skin and nipple sparing mastectomy it can be done in cases of DCIS and your early breast cancer now it is done only if your tumor is more than one centimeter away from the skin more than one centimeter away from the skin and it is around more than two centimeter away from the nipple so these are your conditions in which you could do a skin and nipple sparing mastectomy then breast conservation surgery is rooming, removing tumor with one centimeter margin now breast conservation therapy is your bcs plus radiotherapy all patients who undergo bcs would mandatory receive radiotherapy now what are your contraindications of bcs so let's discuss a few contraindications of your BCS they include your multi centricity right then a large tumor to breast ratio 
then we have two times positive surgical margin after re-excision two times positive margin after re-excision sorry right then we have it is a history of chest wall radiation then we have history of collagen vascular disease then we have history of ankylosing spondylitis and last we have history of orthopnea right patients with severe orthopnea why because patient would not be able to lie on the radiation table right so this is your contraindications of your breast conservation surgery then we have your wide local excision in your wide local excision around up to 20 percent of breast volume can be excised right with adequate margins right and the closure of defect and your closure of defect can be done by approximation of breast tissue right then we have your oncoplastic procedure which are classified into level 1 and level 2 so this is when more than 20 percent of breast volume needs to be excised right so level 1 is your volume displacement and level 2 is your volume replacement right so let's take a look at few of the examples uh, so these are the images which are again taken from your Bailey and Love so first we have this volume displacement oncoplasty of an upper outer quadrant tumor right and then the below images shows you the vol uh, volume displacement by a round block oncoplasty technique and a replacement oncoplasty in case by a muscle sparing glatimus dorsi right. right now for the axilla treatment to stage right we do a sentinel lymph node biopsy so the sentinel lymph node is your first draining lymph node so the various techniques for the sentinel lymph node biopsy includes your fluorescent dye then we have your blue dye technique and your endocyanin uh, green dye technique and then to treat includes your axillary lymph node dissection so when do we do axillary lymph node dissection when we have node positive axillary lymph node which are proven or node positive axillary uh, nodes right which are clinically palpable then we have your biopsy proven axillary non-palpable nodes and we have your last presence of sentinel lymph nodes right so three more than three or more sentinel lymph node biopsy have positive for your macro metastasis so this are your indications when you would do an axillary lymph node dissection now moving down to the next part 
is your breast reconstruction. So this breast reconstruction part has been explained beautifully in your recent edition of Bailey and Love. So I have just taken the chart from your Bailey and Love as it is. Right, so the breast uh, cancer surgery, this flow chart, candidate for the breast surgery, it could be a volume displacement oncoplasty. So over here is only the breast tissue rearrangement and then we have a volume replacement oncoplasty. So it could be uh, done with an autologous fat grafting or skin muscle fascia or combined flap. Then the conditions that require mastectomy, you could use an expander or implant based reconstruction or it could be an autologous reconstruction using the latimus dorsi fly, other tissue sources and abdomen based flaps like CRAM and DIP and then it could either be a combined autologous plus implant. So if we look at few of the examples, so this is a reconstruction using the latimus dorsi flap. This is using a transverse abdominus muscle flap and this is another beautiful diagram where they have shown the various autologous tissue option. So this is your latimus dorsi myocutaneous flap. This is your deep inferior epigastric flap. Then we have an anterior lateral flap, a profunda artery perforator flap, a superior gluteal artery perforator flap, an inferior artery gluteal, gluteal perforator flap and transverse upper gracilis myocutaneous flap. So these are your various autologous tissue options for your breast reconstruction. Hi friends, so this is the third and the final part of your breast cancer video. So let's continue our discussion. Now with respect to adjuvant radiation. So when do we give this adjuvant radiation? In cases of locally advanced breast cancer, following BCS or after mastectomy, if your tumor is sized more than five centimeter, if it is a grade 3 tumor, if there are positive axillary lymph nodes, right? if there is presence of lymphovascular invasion and if there is presence of skin or chest wall involvement. Right? Then this axilla should not be radiated after axillary clearance because it increases the chances of lymphedema. Right. Now, there's another concept of accelerated partial breast irradiation, which has been mentioned in your recent Bailey and Love. So, the suitable group includes your age, more than 60 years, tumor size less than 2 cm, a T1 stage of tumor, margins negative at least by 2 mm, histology of invasive ductal carcinoma, no DCIS component, any grade, no LVI, ER status being positive, unicentric tumor and clinically unifocal with total size less than 2 cm, uh, end stage of N0 and no neoadjuvant chemotherapy. So this forms your suitable group for accelerated partial breast irradiation. Now, Coming down to the adjuvant chemotherapy, the most common regimens used include are CMF, which is cyclophosphamide, methotrexate, and 5-fluorouracil. Then we have some taxin-based regimens, which are your docetaxel and paclitaxel. Then we have some anthracycline-based regimen, which includes your adramycin and epirubicin. Now, when do we give this adjuvant chemotherapy? All invasive cancer more than one centimeter in diameter. Any tumor with more than 5.5 uh, centimeter in size and consisting of poor prognostic factors and node positive tumors. Then this has been also added in your recent Bailey and Love and it has been in a lot of use in current practice regarding your gene signature panels. So why? Why do we need this uh, gene signature panels? It is because to know the benefit of chemotherapy in low risk tumor that is ER positive, HER2 negative and node negative. So the important genetic signature panels that you guys should remember include a Oncotype DX which is a 21 gene panel, ProSigma, Mammoprint which is again your 70 gene panel. Right. So these are very important points with respect to your gene signature panels. 
Now regarding your uh, targeted therapy, this targeted therapy is towards your HER2 new receptor. Right. We all know the drug that has that is used over here and it has been many times asked in your exam also which is transduzumab and it can be used in combination with perti or muzumab. Right. Then we have a hormonal therapy. So the hormonal therapy includes your selective estrogen receptor modulator right which is your tamoxifen and it is used mainly in your pre menopausal women then we have another hormonal therapy which are your aromatase inhibitors right they are used in your post menopausal women since they cause a decrease in density of bone a DEXA scan is recommended before starting of aromatase inhibitors right so you have your hormonal therapy which is your SERM and your aromatase inhibitor used in postmenopausal and tamoxifen used in premenopausal women right then regarding the follow up it includes a clinical examination every 3 months for 2 years followed by every 6 months for next 3 years followed by yearly and in patients those who have implants or BRCA gene mutation we need to get an MRI done annually. Now regarding the genetic risk the important genes involved are BRCA1 and BRCA2. BRCA1 is located in 17q21 and BRCA2 is located in 13q12.3. It has a 40% risk of ovarian cancer in term in cases of BRCA1 and BRCA2 has 20 right. So you can remember 2, 2 and then BRCA1 has a 50 to 85 percent lifetime risk whereas BRCA2 has only a 50 to 60 percent lifetime risk. Now regarding the indications of genetic risk evaluation this has been again beautifully given in a table in your recent edition of your Bailey and Love so which I have included over here. So these are your indications for genetic risk evaluation an individual at any age with a known pathogenic or likely pathogenic variant in cancer susceptibility gene within the family. Breast cancer diagnosed at age less than 50 years. Then TNBC diagnosed age less than 60 years. Two breast cancer primaries. Breast cancer at any age one or more related with breast cancer diagnosed at less than 50 years or invasive ovarian cancer, male breast cancer or pancreatic cancer, high grade or metastatic prostate cancer. Then breast cancer at any age with two or more affected relatives, right, male breast cancer and an individual with a personal or family history of three or more of the following which is breast cancer, sarcoma, adrenocortical carcinoma, brain tumor, leukemia, colon cancer, endometrial cancer, thyroid cancer, kidney cancer, dermatological manifestation, macrocephaly, hamartomas, polyps of GI tract. Then it also includes your lubular breast cancer and diffuse gastric cancer. Then your breast cancer, gastrointestinal cancer, hamartomotus, polyps, ovarian sex cord, tumors, pancreatic cancer, testicular cell tumors and childhood skin pigmentation. So this are your indications for genetic risk evaluation. Just make sure that you keep revising this table because one or two questions are expected to be asked from this table. Now a few important points regarding your breast cancer in pregnancy. It is most commonly associated with your triple negative breast cancer. In suspected metastasis 
we do a MRI without gandelium contrast since doing a CT scan could be harmful for the fetus. In first and second trimester, it is said that MRM is preferred because if you do a breast can conservation surgery, then the radiotherapy has to be delayed. That is after the delivery of the baby, which could be a potential high risk to the mother uh, if the radiotherapy is delayed. Right. Then we have your sentinel lymph node with low dose technetium tag sulfur is safe for fetus. Then no chemotherapy over CT over here is your no chemotherapy in your first trimester. Then your 5 fluorouracil should be avoided and the preferred agents are your anthracyclines and taxanes. Right. Now coming down to the next topic which is your prognosis of the breast cancer. So again I have included this table from your Bailey and Love which has beautifully explained your various prognostic factors. Please remember the most important prognostic factor is your lymph node status and in case of a metastatic uh, cancer it is your hormone status right. So the various prognostic factors includes a size of tumor, stage of disease, axillary lymph node involvement, grade of tumor, histopathological variant that is HER2 positive and triple negative, presence of lymphovascular invasion, extensive DCI component and high KI67 index. And your patient factors include your younger age, premenopausal woman, BRCA associated tumor, family history of breast cancer, prior history of breast cancer, obesity and sedentary lifestyle and failure to complete intended treatment. Right. So, Another image from your Bailey and Love. So this is a condition which is known as angiosarcoma, which arises from the endothelial cell lining vascular or lymphatic channel. It is associated with prior radiotherapy and has a poor prognosis. Right. So uh, this, uh, with this, we come to the end of the discussion of the important topics from breast uh, cancer. So we have covered from the risk factor to prognosis to reconstruction to the adjuvant therapy all the important points and the previous year asked question and the potential MCQs in this. Thank you.